Okay. Um, we we on the first show there. Um, now, if the P portion right here, and you can see that where people have the proportional and the integral used by itself or the proportional by itself, if it's used by itself, the control will never reach set point if the load doesn't change, okay? All right, follow me through this. Let's say we have a constant load, and the load never changes. And as we get closer and closer to the set point, the valve, the cooling valve, let's say we're cooling, it's a cooling application, will get to that point where the valve is fully, fully closed before it actually ever reaches set point. So that droop that we talked about earlier, the difference between the set point and the difference between the control point will be will be that droop right there. It will stay there. It'll never, you'll never capture it. You'll never capture it. So uh, if that's proportional is the only one used then you'll always have a droop. Uh, it can be weighted in the PID. In other words, it can, it can be used twice in the summation, or it can be used three times, or it can be used once. It can have a weighting, and you typically, when you're setting the PID up, that's when you do the weighting. And it's one of the algebraic uh, functions that are summed as part of the PID. <clears throat> Integral portion. Basically, what it does is it offsets the set point. So let's say we have it set for 72 degrees, and it's way away from that set point. So what we do is we, we set the set point to something higher to make it work harder, okay? So it basically offsets the set point so that the desired set point can be achieved. And that's what it does. It'll offset it inside the machine, but you'll still have to set for 72 up there. But inside the PID, it'll be telling it, Oh, it's really 71.5, or it's really 73, according to what you really need. Um, and it can be weighted, it can be weighted uh, as a part of the PID, just like the others can. So it can use it one time, or twice, or three times, and it's part of that algebraic function as well. The D is to minimize the oscillations, okay? And it looks at the slope of the curve. So if we have a function of, a, of an algebraic curve that is proportional directly, it'll go up like this. Well, it looks at the slope of the curve, and it sees what the curve's doing. And it takes a look at that slope, and if the slope's getting further away from where it's supposed to be, it takes action. It basically drives the valve open more. But the main function of the D portion of it <clears throat> is to prevent the oscillations in curves. It kind of like predicts the future. It's kind of looking in the future tense of, of it. And again, it can be weighted uh, as a weighted part of the PID, so it can have more authority than the others or less, and it's also part of that summation of the algebraic function. PIDs, remember we said it a minute ago, they work on errors. You're either on target or you're away from target. That's all it knows. On or away, and it looks at the error. And the P portion looks at the present error, the error right now. The I portion looks at past errors or a history of errors. As a matter of fact, if you're tuning the PID, you'll look at it and it'll have accumulated errors. And it'll have a field over here on your software screen, and it'll show you what those accumulated errors are. And then the D predicts what the future error is going to be so it can have the authority that it needs to make the control go where it needs to go to. P is a ratio, I is an offset, and D is a forecast. That's really kind of what you need to remember on this whole thing that I've been talking about. So if you forget everything that I've been talking about for the last seven minutes, and you remember right there, that right there, you'll be doing pretty good as it comes to a PID. P is ratio, I is offset, and D is forecast. Now I know right about now you're probably saying, unless you know this already, dead gummit. I don't think I'm ever going to get this. Well, we all sit in that position one day. You guys are 20 and 30-something. I'm 60-something. So there's a big difference. You will get it. It'll come to you. And like I said, that 10th time around the track, you know, finally Eureka, it'll hit you. And you'll get it. So don't give up on these things. Uh, we're going to talk about now uh, sequenced outputs, what they're used for. They're used to drive this, this valve right here which is a stepper motor. And basically that means it sequentially moves. It sequentially moves. And um, 
I'm going to be real quiet right here for a second. Can y'all hear that, that bow moving? Can I hear that? Okay. That's moving 200 steps per second, okay? If you watch those lights right there, that's moving one step. And you're going to see how that correlates to the position of that bow. Now, do you guys use step valves in automobiles? And do you work on cars? Okay, okay. Well, y'all probably have stepper valves in the uh, uh, damper operators for the uh, uh, air conditioning things. Yeah, those are probably stepper valves and sequence there. But you see how that sequence is open and closed? It's closed right now. Can you see those lights? Okay. That's sequence now. And I'm going to leave this here so y'all can play with it later. Uh, but uh, basically, they, they sequence the valves. They operate off 12 volts, and they basically have two types of valves. You have a unipolar and a bipolar. Bipolar is, is a, of course, has two. Uni means they're all connected together. Uh, the sequence is each one of those increments right there is a step. If you can actually look in that valve, and if you, if you go to, uh, I'll tell you, there's a good application. If you Google step, stepper motor, uh, Wikipedia, is that what I'm saying? I'm not saying it right. Wikipedia. And if you go on the Wikipedia, there is a picture that looks something very similar to this, and it shows that animation of that stepper motor working. It's one of the best animations I've ever seen. And, and it shows the sequence of the lighting or, or how, they're, how they're energized and how they move the valve around, okay? Uh, but they're very, very accurate. Very accurate. It's one good thing about stepper motors. This shows the motor sequence, the sequence of lights that were flashed a minute ago, and the open and the closed sequence, and just basically shows how they step the valve around uh, for those sequences. Basically, the, 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 the valve movement operates by a motor turning, which turns a threaded uh, 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 stud that comes out of there, and then this, this pin moves up and down on that thread. Uh, Sporlin has a name for that. Uh, digital interaction. You see, you got the stepper motor right here, and it looks like a clock mechanism. The threaded action right there, and then there's a pin on the end of that to control the refrigerator. Now, have you guys taken an expansion, a regular expansion valve apart yet? No. Y'all need to do that. It's basically a little pin and a carrier, and it's kind of like that, except it moves up and down based upon the movement of this valve right here. Uh, just a higher pitch resolution picture right there. The EXV is the unipolar valve, which is uh, the least expensive valve. It's kind of made, this would be what you see on a residential application right here. Uh, this valve right here is the SCR valve, and this is what you would see like on a commercial application or a, a, a refrigeration unit, uh, i.e. A, a closed door case, you know, five door frozen food case is where you would see this. But you would actually see it would be down in the bottom of the case, I hope. Uh, Typically, the valve would be in the bottom of the case where the coil is, and this device right here would be on top of the case, up uh, on top of the case up there. And there'd be an interconnecting cable, this right here, between the two of them. Uh, these are larger valves. This probably you would see on a chiller. This is something um, that you would see on a cascade system, refrigeration system, that may, may have CO2 on the top cycle. It's a larger valve. And of course, this right here is all Sporlin's valves and their applications that they have uh, right here. And I think they go up to 400 nominal tons, if I remember correctly, R22. Uh, some of the things that you need to know when you're functioning, and I'm only saying this so that when you pull that, uh, that, that sheet open and you begin to play with this valve a little bit, you'll know some of the parameters that you have to program or the steps. Some of them have, they all have different steps, like this EX, uh, ESX valve. It's kind of a cheap, cheap valve. It's 400 steps between fully open and fully closed. The valve right here that we have, this SCR valve, is 2,500 steps between fully open and fully closed. So this valve, if it's the same tonnage valve, this valve is going to have more resolution, isn't it? It's going to give you tighter control. And it's a lot more expensive valve than that ESX uh, valve is right there. Some of the other valves are higher tonnage valves, uh, the SCI 50 and 175. Uh, and it, but anyway, the important part of this is if you have this specific valve and you're configuring 
uh, or setting up the parameters in this controller, you have to match the steps up with the step function in here, okay? You'll see that when you do it. Okay, the controllers look like this. Now, <clears throat> basically you walk up to this, and, and the reason that I, uh, actually I had the idea of building this and asked David to help me uh, with this, I told him what I wanted to do. We have um, cases that have electronic valves in them, uh, refrigeration cases like you guys do. And I wanted something where my guys could come to the office because they, you know, I get a tip, typically I get a call say, hey boss, or big cheese is what they call me sometimes. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to go to the deer camp and I want to hurry up and uh, get out of here in a hurry. Uh, and I got this valve that looks like this and I get this white box up here and I don't know how to make it work which is this thing right here, okay? And it's got Kelvin 2 on it. And I say, well, Cookie, don't you know how to make that thing work? He said, well, if I did, I wouldn't be calling you. <laughs> he says, and we got about 15 minutes because I'm leaving to go to the deer stand here in just a few minutes, you know. So um, uh, I've got this thing that David and I built so that a guy could come up, like y'all, plug into it with his Cat 5 cable and see exactly what he's going to see in the supermarket. Okay, and this, this particular application would be a supermarket application. The heat pump that I told you about in my house, it has this, uh, had that EXV, that black looking valve on there. Uh, it, uh, its control is part of the heat pump control board, okay? It doesn't have a separate control board like this. Now see, is that a power uniform? Y'all sell Linux equipment, right? We do. And y'all have variable speed, y'all have uh, these stepper valves in some of your products, right? right. Do, do y'all have your uh, an independent controller for them, or does Linux have their own board controller? Linux controls? has, yeah, Linux has their own. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, do, you, do you know what brand that y'all use particularly? Is, are they Alco, or Danfoss, or Sporlin, or, or do you know? I'm not quite sure, actually. Okay. It's hard to tell from looking at the valve unless you know exactly what you're looking at. Uh, and sometimes, you know, they have look like valves, or sometimes there'll be an OEM valve, and then you know, so you won't be able to tell, but it's still relevant because when you have when you have their valve, you default to their material, and they'll tell you exactly what what you need to know. But it's good to know this because you'll have some kind of idea of how the valves work. But anyway, <clears throat> so we did this so a guy could walk up to it, plug into it, and typically you'll have one of these for every every three, four, five door case according to what you have. Every expansion valve will have one, um, and um, here is the valve right here, but it's, it's actually mounted right in here on this uh, unit cooler evaporator right here, okay? It's mounted right here, uh, but in the case, it would normally be down in the case. So, the good thing about that is, is used to, remember we want to check the superheat on something, we would have to go open up the case and pull the product out of the bottom of it, pull the pan up and get down in there and start checking superheat. Now all we have to do to check the superheat is is we plug this device in right there at, at the, at the, at the uh, on top of the uh, case right there at the device and we can we can see what our superheat is. We can see what all the parameters are uh, on this thing and right now it's in the position of of uh, right there zero and the temperature out or the temperature coming out to tell the coil is 70 degrees, and the state that it's in is in superheat is hold on 55, and let me get over here to the state. The state is should be in pump down mode, okay? Because I put this little switch up here to emulate a pump down. In other words, a, a relay says pump it down, okay? So it's in the pump down mode. So right now it's not calling at all. All right. Uh, you can get them with uh, the display on them, uh, but when you got 100 of them in the store, it's a lot cheaper for the manufacturer to put that on there and then have one display unit to go around the store. Now they can be interlinked together on what they call a mod bus and, or uh, network together and you'd have a laptop. You go to the laptop and you go to the address or you could even use this on uh, this address bus right here. Still use this de device right here and go and go to the address that you want 
and then hit you hit the button, jig the button as Jay Clower says, and then get the parameters off of that valve. Yes, sir. Uh, now, can you run all those uh, without the display and uh, hook them up to where you can control them off of the E2? Uh, I don't know if you can control this particular valve off of an E2. I know that you can control an Alco valve off of an E2. Uh, but now, let me, let me go back and say this. I think that, that I think that the E2 controller does have a mod bus function in here. And uh, the E2 controller has mod bus, and this also speaks mod bus. Now, mod bus is a control language, okay? It's really kind of a primitive control language, but it's a common control language that everybody's controller speaks. So, yes, you can speak through the E2 to this through Modbus, but you may have to jump to a different level, you know what I mean, to get to that level, versus just walking up and linking into it. Yes, sir. Now, how is that wired into the, to the system? Okay. How is this wired into the, the system? Forward. Okay. This right here? Uh -huh. Okay, now this is just a Cat5 cable. Uh, like you use to connect uh, any kind of Ethernet together with or a bus together with. It's just a Cat5 cable. I plug it in here and I plug it in here. Now this is, and, and this is one of those things that y'all can, uh, can look at later. And y'all can even, if you want to, <coughs> wire it or unwire. This is wired into this, this system right here. Can you see that good right there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have those cables that go up. You have a cable that goes, of course, you power it up through the transformer, uh, through those terminals right there. You have a cable that goes up to the expansion valve. <clears throat> you have a, a cable that goes up to the uh, pressure transducer, which is right here, okay? And then you have uh, some input switches. Right here's an input switch for pump down. That, I'm just faking it out with this pump down switch. You have a thermistor right here that comes over and wires into it. Um, and then there's a, a suction line through Mr. over here that wires into it. Now, it really only uses two, two of those devices for control of superheat, and that's the suction line temperature and the pressure transducer, the two things it uses to calculate superheat, okay? Uh, so that, that's what it does. And so that's how it's connected to the system. Now, remember, uh, this would be <clears throat> connected to the uh, in close proximity. Uh, and I say that because I think this cable, well, you can get it in, they call it meters, but if you string it out, you can see it's pretty long. It'll get you a 12 foot case. You can put the controller up here and then bring your, loop your cable down and get to the valve to the end of the case if you want to, okay? So that's how long that is. So uh, that would be up on top of the refrigerated case. And then, of course, that would be down in if none of your other pieces would, would connect by those cables, by way of those cables there, okay? Did I answer your question or not? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, this is, I'm going to leave this with you too, see how I play with it. This is a diagram that shows us connection ports. Uh, and, and terminals 13, 14, and 15 is, is the connection port for that mod bus, okay? So if you wanted to communicate with other, other controllers, uh, then that's where you would connect it to, uh, is to that mod bus. Now, but on this application, we just have one controller. But you could gang them together, so to speak, and have multiple controllers uh, on that, okay? Uh, I have two different kinds of sensors, and remember I'm going over this because <clears throat> these are what we're using now. We're talking about the sensors that we're using now. This sensor that we passed around with the brass was a 2 or 3K sensor. 3K. Thank you, 3K. 3K sensor. Notice it kind of looks like it's made to go on a pipe or mount onto a pipe, there it is, and when you connect it, you want to make sure that you've got uh, some type of uh, some type of uh, thermal contact grease right there. And guys, this actually, this is a spoiling picture. I don't know why they put those wire ties on. That's, that's the first no-no of, of, uh, of mountain expansion valve bulb or sensors. You don't use, uh, you don't use a wire tie because you're not going to get good thermal contact with that. You don't want to over clamp it either, but you got to use metal. David, you have a statistic uh, I think earlier it's, today. If I recall one of the seminars that we was in, uh, I think the presenter said that two-thirds of the transfer is done through the actual hardware, meaning the mounting uh, material, to the thermal bug. 
Now, I got to looking at that one. That that bub is actually, or that sensor is actually contoured to fit on a pipe, whereas a regular uh, thermal, uh, excuse me, the regular power head sensor would not be. It's right. like putting two zeros together. If you look at two zeros, you really don't have a whole lot of contact mm -hmm. where the two are. This may be a little bit different, Steve. Yeah, you know, it might be that. And I am going to, yeah, you brought that up this, this morning, and I am going to ask them. Uh, now, you know, they do make a tie tie that you clamp down with a gun. Y'all have seen that where you like pull it and it pulls it really tight. Mm -hmm. But uh, I am going to ask Borland uh, what their preferred method of, of connecting these things to the, uh, 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 to the suction arm. I know we've been doing this for years. We use a metal clamp. We use a metal clamp for, uh, for, for how we clamp them there. But uh, I'm going to ask them if this is acceptable right here or not, or it may just be for demonstration purposes only. I don't know. David, how do we do ours on here? I don't know. I'm afraid to look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we got it. I think we got it covered up. Guys, whatever y'all do, y'all can do anything, but do not take this piece of insulation off back here. <laughs> it, it might be ugly into there. I don't you know. know. Uh, Steve, if I may, things like that. I, I had no idea about that until I went to a seminar. Now, I can't say that traveling from here to LA would have been cost effective there to learn that little bit, because, but I learned much more out there. But you never quit learning, unless you're as old as Steve. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't quit learning. I mean, uh, that, I mean I'm, I'm being serious when I say this. I really, I, I learn something every it doesn't matter who I talk to that's in the business, and I don't care how long they've, they've not been associated with the business, and I'll say how green they are to it. I always learn something from listening to them. You know, like, you know, when you go to a seminar or something, I mean, I've learned stuff from guys who've been in the business less than a year, and I've been in since 1971. You know, and I'm still, the, the, I still learn stuff from guys that are younger. You know, they have a new perspective, you know, on, on the way they look at things. So it is, it is important, uh, as David says. And did you learn that in L.A., David? I think I did. That was good. That was good. Tell them what else you learned, David, in, in L.A. <laughs> Beautiful out there. <laughs> uh, I got, well, I'm going to ask your class this question. Can uh -huh. I ask them? <laughs> you go right ahead. Okay. I, I deserve I'm this. Ask, um, this is a question I'm going to ask y'all. Uh, a heating device called a convector transfers heat primarily by A, Osmosis, B, stratification, or C, convection. What would your answer be? Oh, C. Would you say that? Yeah. Well, our dispatcher, who don't know nothing about air conditioning or refrigeration, was in the room, said the same thing. But Taylor, what was your answer? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> we were jet lagged. We, really were. We, were, we were jet lagged, weren't we, David? Yeah. <laughs> we were tired. We were tired. Uh, and plus, they didn't see it. They had a bunch of guys talking. They don't talk like we do from up in Pittsburgh. And they had some from California. They, they just don't speak like we do down here. Uh, and, and I, you know, we were in the back. For some reason, they put us in the back of the room this time. Did you notice that, baby? Yeah, I did. But we I, I, won the first ever trophy, didn't we? Yeah, we did. I just, uh, fellas, I just went completely blank. And if that's, that's my. <laughs> That's my excuse, it and I'm sticking to it. It wouldn't have been sociable to go out there and kick their butt in California and bring the trophy back, David. Just go ahead and say it. I, no, I, nice. I wanted the trophy back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be nice about that. Uh, uh, you mount, you mount, can you back to the lesson plan here? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, you mount it traditionally like you do a regular expansion valve bulb in the uh, 4 or 8 o'clock position. When you're making electrical connections, guys, these are your connections right here. Uh, usually scotch, these three of scotch locks, UR2s, or whatever you are that you have that you're using, uh, because they, they do a couple things. They, 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 make the, they make the connection and they provide a ceiling here. Probably the number one problem with these things is after they've been installed, I can't you open up the bottom of the cage, you see a couple of wire nuts in there with tape on it, they get corroded and it changes the resistance of this so it doesn't read right. So you got to use these connectors right here. They cost a little more, but you got to do it. Uh, pressure transducer, it is very specific. The, the uh, thermistors and transducers are very specific. 
uh, has a, has a uh, uh, this is not one of them right there, but the one that's on there, has a plug that matches it and is used for its purposes. Um, basically, when you see this right here, when you get the material and you start looking at it, playing with it out in the lab, you'll see that uh, we have the 150 transducer in there and you can calculate your voltage and see what the pressure is to make sure it's accurate. That's basically for calibration purposes. Is you take your voltage minus 0.5 volts, multiplied by 37.5 on this particular transducer to give you what the pressure should be. Okay, now, I don't know if I said it just right. If I put that pressure gauge on the low side of the system and I measure the voltage between like pins 34 and 35, I believe, you can double check me on that, and uh, the voltage should be, uh, take my voltage minus 0.5 voltage times 37.5. That's what my voltage should read on my VON, okay? That's DC volts, by the way, DC volts. And that'll tell you whether it's accurate or not. And then there's an offset in here, and it tells you how to do that, uh, to do the offset uh, to calibrate this and the, and the thermistors as well. Uh, there's a quick connection diagram of it. Uh, the connections that we were talking about, how is it wired into the system? Basically, you bring uh, your, your 24 volts in here. Uh, this right here is a, is a 240 volt, uh, 3 amp rated contact. It is not the voltage coming in. Yours truly almost wired it up uh, that way right there. But my buddy, back in the room, the little short fat guy with a bald head, <laughs> said, Steve, you don't want to do that. And it was kind of late in the afternoon. I said, what do you mean, David? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you. <laughs> uh, and he says, that's a switch right there. I said, you know what, David, you're right. That's a switch right there. So, uh, but anyway, I'll, you be careful that that is a relay contact right there. Uh, these are the connection points for the transducers and the various sensors. Uh, the pump down switch, the communication port, I don't have that hooked up right there, okay? That's just a little closer connection to it. Uh, in your appendix, the handouts that I'm going to leave with you, you'll see that uh, the processes that we talked about right here uh, when we look at this controller uh, that come up uh, are right here, dial on it first, then it tells you how to get down into the controller to drill down into it. The, Passcode is 111, and then when you get down and, and drill into it, you have the processes without without just plugging in. And you have those, those basic processes right there. But if you want to drill down and start changing stuff, uh, the passcode is 111. It's written on there, so you don't have to remember that. But then you have all these other parameters that you can change and set, okay? And don't worry about getting them out of discombobulation, I want you to open the valve up, let the machine run, watch it flood back, try to bring the superheat down to two degrees, set the superheat high, do whatever you want with it, okay? Remember, you tear it up, we can fix it. We can fix it. Don't worry about that. Have, have some fun with it and, uh, and observe the refrigeration system as well. There are a couple of side ports on here so you can see this should be vapor and oil coming back. You'll see liquid coming back. Uh, coming out of the accumulator, you'll see you'll see liquid coming out of there too, uh, if it's flooding back bad enough. So you know, observe those things. Use it as a, a kind of a trainer as well to observe the refrigeration system. Uh, this device right here slows the fan up and down, you, uh, or cuts it completely off. It slows it down to reduce the load. You can watch it, the suction pressure change, or you can add the load to it by speeding it up. So the rocket scientists can figure that out, didn't it? Just so you'll know, you've got the switches here, one's for the compressor, one's for the whole machine, the other one will cut the compressor off if you want to do that. And this is the pump down switch up here, and which means the pump is in pump down mode right now when it says on. Um, just to, just to, that's not going to be in these instructions right here. But anyway, you get to all these other parameters that you want to set and change, and it tells you what the defaults are and what and what they're changing. And when you begin to do this, okay? If you forget everything else I've talked to you about tonight, about the group and the PID and all that, if that's just not like clicking, clicking with you yet, when you start to mess with this thing is when you'll start getting it, okay? When you start seeing the superheat coming down, when you start seeing the suction line crossed up, when you start seeing those things change in the coils, you know, actually take your thermal couple and measure these different parts of the coils, the single circuit coil 
and see how these temperature changes affect it at different loads. And uh, do, just do some labs. When you start doing this, you'll start getting a connection with, with the device and how it works, okay? So uh, do that. These are some alarms that come out. And basically, this is under sheet two. It tells you what alarm you get and what, uh, what's going to happen when it gets that alarm. And uh, the first two right there, it goes into a pump down load. If you have a sensor failure or a, a transducer failure for your uh, pressure, it goes into the pump down mode to protect the compressor. If you have a low superheat mode, it goes into a super hyperactive mode where it really starts to close it out quickly so as to get the superheat up. Because remember, we want superheat to protect the compressor, right? That's what we want to do. Is that them or me? That's them. Okay. Uh, and then high superheat, it just gives you an alarm out with no response. Okay, resources. Uh, www.sporting.online. And you got these two bulletins right here. They are also in that sheet that you'll have. Uh, it's great. So, questions. You got questions you want to ask me? No questions? Okay, good. Get that thing in the lab. Don't do that. Do everything but that. <laughs> I've done that several times. Several times. Uh, I, I will end with one short story. One short story I'll end with. And actually, David and I built this device right here. We actually took it up to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and did an RSCS presentation with it on this and some other stuff. <clears throat> but back, y'all y'all know who Muhammad Ali is, don't you? The boxer. Mm -hmm. How about Ernie Shavers? Y'all remember him? Mm -hmm. Ernie Shavers was kind of a big guy, bigger, bigger, uh, not as big as Larry Holmes, but almost as big, but ball headed, just just a brutal kind of boxer, you know. He was just a brutal guy. And so uh, Muhammad Ali was my and David's favorite fighter, and he was boxing Ernie Shavers. He was going to be the. It was going to be better than the thrill of Manila. It was on TV. And so I had one of the big TVs that weighed about 400 pounds at my house. This is when we were in our 20s, wasn't it, David? Early 20s. Early 20s. My wife had taken the kids, and she'd gone up to her mama's house, and me and David had the house to ourselves, and we were sitting there watching the TV with our little snacks, and the TV looked good, and the fight was getting ready to come on. <clears throat> David says, I just was at the Bo Tech School, and I took a TV repair course, and I could make that TV brighter. I said, yeah. yep. He said, "Yes, I even have this. I even have a special, True. special plastic screwdriver to adjust it with." Yep. I said, "Okay, David." He gets back in, he twigs on a little bit. I said, "Oh, David, that looks good." He looks up. You know, he's all him, all him, all. We weren't as fat back then. We were both skinny. <laughs> and he gets up on there. He looks at. I can do better than that. He him a little bit. I said, that's, "That's good, David. That's good." He, he looks up a little bit. He said, that, 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 "I can do better than that." He twists a little more, and all of a sudden you hear something, and it looks like a cartoon. There's a big puff of smoke and all this electrical stuff coming out of the TV, and the TV goes blank. We didn't get to see. I didn't get to see. No, you didn't get to go home. I went home and watched it. I was gonna kill it. I was gonna kill it. No, that I knew Beverly was coming home. Yeah, Beverly was coming home. So, but anyway, anyway, this is. Forty years later, yep. <laughs> forty years later, me and him are in Murfreesboro, and my wife sends me a text and says, "Tell David not to be working on any TV yeah. set." Yeah. So, who goes around comes around, David. So, don't let the smoke out of it of yourself. You can let the smoke out of that, but don't let the smoke out of yourself. Okay, guys. All right, well, y'all been a great class. I thank you for putting up with me. Okay. Thank you. All right. Here, I'm gonna leave this stuff here.